Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect podcast, your favorite podcast that includes industry-facing conversations with the industry's leading experts that aim to educate and inform the public regarding the plant's endless benefits. My guest today is Greg Autry. He's the founder and CEO at Sweet Sensei. Mr. Greg Autry, how are you doing, man? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. It's it's great to see you uh, since I visited Sweet Sensi's grow facility back in April. And uh, I want to thank you again for having me, man. I really enjoyed coming out. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Of course. I kind of, I, I, I joke because after when I was reflecting about my experience there, I kind of felt like a, uh, a Willy Wonka type thing because, <laughs> you know, I got there, I'm sitting in the lobby, I'm talking with Clay, one of, you know, a p- person on your team, really nice guy. And you know, you come in, you're, t- you're telling me about, you know, your passion for the plant, you know, the, the unique ways in which you guys grow and extract. And uh, I even got to taste some of the candy and then I, I got the tour, <laughs> you know, so yeah. it was uh, it was a really cool experience, man. Yeah, I mean, what's going on here? A lot of people um, make the same comment and they think it's uh, very unique. And I, I think it, it is. It's just something that has been um, my life's work and a bunch of the guys that that are here, I mean, they've spent the majority of their lives working for us and me and my company. And um, yeah, we've just we've been doing it a long time. And so we're just grateful to be doing it now in Texas. So yeah, that's a perfect segue. And it's it's so clear that you and of course, your team this your staff is, is so passionate about cannabinoid therapeutics and ensuring that what you're putting in your bodies is not harmful. And so um, before we get into Sweet Sensi's processes, let's first talk about your background, Greg. I mean, you're a living legend. You've dedicated, like you said, your, the most of your life, you know, to this plant and growing. So let's talk about your experience, maybe first, you know, breeding and then talking about, you know, how you worked on this, this extraction method um, that in 2015 and, and just, you know, overall what you've been working on. Yeah. So the, my cannabis career really started in 96. Um, I had friends um, out of high school that were going to Southern California because Prop 215 had passed. And so I've always lived in Texas and then traveled out there for work and and worked there in in the beginning of my career. And then um, I also, uh, you know, sometime uh, close to the year 2000, 2001, I became very active in the online communities. And that's really how this company started is um, through helping other people and being a moderator on some of the the major forums and cannabis infirmaries on there and helping people figure out what's wrong with their plants by them sharing pictures and parameters they were using and what's wrong with their uh, mechanical extraction methods and how to get better at it. And by sharing that and you and, you know, helping out people, I had larger farmers and larger clients ask me to consult for them, um, which I did that for many years until we built our own facilities in Southern California. And um, once the the farm bill passed in 2018, we knew this was going to happen in Texas. So we started selling off our assets there and uh, moved our, our company and consolidated everything back here in, in Texas. Is it, I mean, was the large part of that, obviously, you know, you're, you said you're a Texas native, you grew up here, but was it also that you saw that there's a, a unique opportunity that, that Texas is poised in when it comes to the hemp industry? Yeah. I mean, we, we all care about Texas because, uh, you know, we're native Texans and native Austinites and from this area. And we had seen, you know, I had seen personally three other emerging markets where there were things that were missing and that farmers um, and and also retailers needed and services that we knew that they were going to need. And we knew that the Texas cannabis or hemp industry was going to need. And so that was a, a big part of wanting to, to move everything back here was uh, to, to help just the hemp industry and Texas succeed. 
Right, right. No, that makes sense. And so before we jump into Sweet Sensi and, and all the great things you're doing within the Texas hemp market, I, I want to talk about you know, going back to 2015. And you, you kind of touched on it, how you know, you were instrumental in in the development of that low heat rosin press type extraction. So why don't you talk about that whole process, the learnings, the findings, the community that kind of worked on that and, and what, what came of it? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different um, opinions on about how, a bunch of different stories about how rosin came about. For the way that rosin came about for us and 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 me and the way I saw it was in 2014, um, there was actually discussions before that on the forums. It, in, in my mind, it all came from the forums. Um, there was uh, someone that was sharing uh, videos of, people taking uh, bubble hash or ice wax and pressing it between their fingers and pressing it um, using different methods where they would just use friction to create something that was similar to BHO. And so what, what happened was in 20, the beginning of 2015, there was discussions uh, between several people that are now companies like ours. Um, and it was a discussion about how to create that sort of extract that looks similar to VHO, but to do it um, in a mechanical way without using um, any solvents or any uh, chemicals. So long story short is, is that process was uh, several months long and there was lots of participants. One of the main uh, people that I accredit with it is um, Soil Grown Sol Solventless, who owns the Sasquatch company, him and Joel and Jessica, um, they, we, our facility was um, in Southern California was 20 minutes from there. So we spent some time over there when they were first getting their company off the ground and building presses. So I would, I just like to say that we were a part of the whole thing and a part of the discussion and, and there from the beginning. Right. And so, I mean, so, I mean, with that, with that, those meetings, you guys kind of, I, I imagine, built prototypes, tested it out, and then got to something where we're kind of seeing that play out today. Yeah, we actually have, which you saw, a press that was um, one of the first ones that was on that discussion and in that forum um, where I altered it. And then someone else made a comment like, you should do this. And someone else sent me some other parts. And so it was really a community and group effort that refined rosin making and still is to this day. Um, I don't I don't claim to be the inventor of rosin and I don't really think anybody else does. It was just something that we all came up with together. A community effort. Yeah, that came through early on online, like you said, through those for forums in the early 2000s. I mean, yeah, talk about that was right at the beginning of when those discussions would take place. So you were right at yep. the forefront. Um, very cool. So, you know, speaking of that unique extraction method, you know, that's a good segue to talk about Sweet Sensi overall and its unique approach to its growing method, right? I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I visited your state-of-the-art facility and you walked me through your hemp hydroponic system. So why don't we mm -hmm. start there and talk about that and then we'll kind of get into your extraction method and and you know what full spectrum means to you and in, in the sweet sensi brand yeah so we grow uh, or i have been growing and recirculating deep water culture um for the most part since 2000 2001 i've had between 400 and 8,000 indoor plants um all grown in hydroponic system recirculating deep water culture and why you know everyone has their own methods um especially us growers that have been doing it this long that they prefer i don't think one is really better than the other um one is just you know fits one's uh growing methods better than another one and then for us it's recirculating deep water culture why i like it is our plants are in constant contact with water we're not telling the plants when they get to um have nutrients and when they don't get to have nutrients so we're just keeping those parameters and those specific temperatures um and environment at at the correct uh levels and everything at the correct parameters so that the plant can um 
do its job on its own and and really thrive on its own. And doing that has has been, you know, many years of trial and error and failures and getting back up and doing it again. Um, and we've had many uh, strange and unique problems, including breeding some strange kind of bacteria early in 2007 or 2006 that we couldn't figure out what it was. But, you know, we've overcome all those things and we use sensors and monitors and real time um, uh, pumps and dosing systems so that we can adjust on the fly from our phones. And we use that technology for all of the farms we consult with and for the farms that we run across the country. And that allows us to really dial in our methods and, and get our terpene profiles and get our cannabinoid profiles where we want them. Yeah, and that was one thing that just fascinated me when when I was going through the tour with you was you know, how you talked about the margin for error with deep water hydroponic growing, right? And, and how yeah. you met you mentioned, like, you know, it's it's state of the art, because like you said, proper dosing, the the amount of water that's circulating every minute, and, and you were telling me that I think that if one thing is off, you have a matter of what seconds to kind of address it before you lose that crop. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, if it was that far off, usually where I see people making mistakes in deep water culture is they they have something that is uh let's say water temperature is in the 80s because these systems do get, get hot and they're not chilling it and so without having your you know your water at the correct temperature your dissolved oxygen is not at the uh correct levels which um prevents a lot of nutrients from being up, uptaken so just that what i talked about right there if that was off um, for several hours, you would start to show deficiencies and plant health would start to decline. What, you know, what we were talking about and what, what you're remembering is if we, if you were to have something wrong in that instance, like your pH was way off and you had a flood and drain table and you flooded them a few times, which could be over the course of a few days, then you're not going to kill them. But if my pH is off for a, a, a quite a bit for several hours, then some plants, depending on their size, could die. So that's what our monitors and, and all that is about, that's talking to our phones and that uh, our, our, uh, our pumps where we're actually pumping in and adjusting pH on the fly and, and doing all that from our mobile devices is, that's what that's all about. Got you. Okay. Yeah. And that, I mean, just reinforces how important that having that real time data is, right? I mean, mm -hmm. just it is for us in deep water culture. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, moving it a step forward. So now, you know, let's kick this off by you telling us what does full spectrum mean to Sweet Sensei as a brand? And um, well, from there, yeah. you know, your your unique extraction method, like we talked about the, the low heat rosin press. Yeah, so I mean, like I said before, we we take a lot of care trying to make sure that um, we're producing certain cannabinoid and, and terpene profiles. And we want our extract methods are made to protect that. And so full spectrum, what that means to, to us is that the, the plant is concentrated um, with all the natural chemical compounds in the same percentages that they are in the plant in, in, in nature and where they naturally occur. So all we're doing is concentrating the plant. We're not altering it. We're not removing anything. We're not adding it. We're just making it more uh, potent and removing the fats and lipids and plant matter. And so by doing that, we're not, we're, um, we're preserving all of the hard work that we've done or all of the hard work that our farmers have done. We're not making some chemical, uh, you know, alteration to it. It is what we grew, and and our minds and our customers' minds, and we can we can say this from all of our reviews, from all of our uh, customers that so we don't have. I can honestly say, Kevin, I have I can track my customers online from when I began my web store. I still have the same first customer that was there. I so I have it. customer retention like you wouldn't believe. Right. I can't say that that's true for friends of mine. And, and I have no problem 
with chemical extraction. I think there's places for it and, and there should be, you know, and, and we want competition like that. And there's, there's people that can't have THC whatsoever. And I can't always produce a product like that without CBG. So, you know, in other words, is we're trying to protect the hard work that we put into growing the plant and that our farmers put into growing the plant. We feel like that's the best use of this because it is medicine to us. So we want uh, our customers and our customers' customers to get you know the best they can out of it. And saying that something is full spectrum, when you've chemically altered it, when you've added something to it, when you've changed that natural chemical compound, it does the whole industry a disservice, in my opinion, is you're telling someone you're get, they're getting something they're not. And what that ends up doing is we're all, we all process these chemical compounds differently. So we all process terpenes differently. We all process cannabinoids differently. So for you to say it's full spectrum and it's not, has a consumer um, giving up on, on hemp products and calling it snake oil and giving it a bad image because they might be more sensitive to myrcene or lemon, limonene or limonene or, you know, or different cannabinoids that you've removed or different terpenes that you've removed during your chemical process. So I just, that's, I, I, that's something that we're real passionate about is protecting the plant in its natural state and letting it do what it was meant to do. And this is maybe this is a dumb maybe question just because I don't know, but is there any way to avoid adding or removing those chemical compounds when doing traditional extraction methods like butane, CO2, like things like that? Or is it, is it? I mean, sure. I've, I've um, been in lots of CO2 labs and I've had friends that are, and I'm, I'm not saying that they can't get close that just the problem that I have is I have tests that are side by side done with some of my farmers material recently this year that have been sent to somewhere where they're using CO2 extraction, uh, other ones where they're using hydrocarbon extraction. We're showing four, five, 10 more terpenes. Right. Um, we're showing higher percentage of cannabinoids. Uh, and I, just to, to see those tests side by side, I don't believe there's a way that they can um, that that chem the chemical process can preserve that that uh, natural uh, percentage of chemical compounds. I, 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 I and I'm I'm always open to discussion. I mean, if there's someone that I mean, and I've had I've had discussions, and some of them get heated, which I try to stay out of. I'm not here to to argue with anybody, but um, you, you know, I I don't see a way chemically to produce a product like we do right. and that's not a bad thing that's not what, what i'm saying is that that product um serves other patients and other consumers well it's just for our consumers and for what we're marketing and what we're doing this is what works best sure that's fair yeah it's the it's the labeling of what you're saying like like you said right. if you have the the test results it's not it's not showing what you're saying it, it is right um, right so, and then, yeah. yeah go ahead no, it's okay. Well, and I was going to say also, you know, and I don't know, you know, you try to stay out of those fights and it's probably a good idea if they would stay out. Cause I, from my understanding, you're a two-time state champion from Tennessee in wrestling. So um, we jammed about that earlier. Cause I too wrestled. Uh, so yeah, I don't think they want to mess with you, Greg. Don't worry about that. <laughs> well, but those, uh, those fighting days are over for me. So <laughs> same, same. Um, well, so here's another thing that I thought was really cool when I went to visit was um, speaking of, you know, the extraction process is, is how much you guys have, have it dialed in, in terms of like, I think you were telling me that, you know, based on a particular strain that you've grown, you've been able to dial it in to understand how much, you know, of the heat temperature you're needed to get a really effective extraction of rosin from that particular strain. Am I butchering All right. that? Or, okay. Yeah. So we have two different forms of, ex of mechanical extraction is like what is what we like to call them. Um, so we do, we make ice wax or uh, bubble hash. Um, so we do that and we, we, um, we use an, that's an ice water wash that we do. And so doing that, um, what we'll do in that method is, sorry, someone just dropped off a bench. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so our extraction methods, um, 
what we're we're doing is we're preserving um, the the chemical compounds, like we said. We are um, we're we've gotten good, Kevin, at dialing in uh, in small amounts farmers and our own uh, flour. And, and so the way that we do that is we'll take an analysis. So several of my guys will sit down and and look under microscopes and and we'll look at um, the kind of trichomes that we see and how much trichomes we're seeing. We'll take test results that we've tested after harvest and we preserve that as we go through. So yeah, one of the ways we do that is every farmer, believe it or not, grows differently. And so they all have different temperatures with our rosin press. Um, every, every farmer, every phenotype, so every sister from a breeding project has a different temperature, has a different pressure, has a different amount of time under the press, has a different filter bag. And so in my opinion, what we've, where we've gotten good at this and making it viable um, and making it possible uh, for us to, to, to make money is we can dial that in in small batches quickly and then move on into large production runs. So um, I don't know if you saw our, our uh, ice water wash lab, but that's fully operational now. We do the same thing there. So we'll add more ice and take away more ice and um, ramp up on agitation there, um, depending on what we're seeing on how the trichomes are falling. And so, yeah, we, um, in our opinion, we've gotten good at, at dialing those um, handmade extracts in. Right. And one of your, you know, I guess, flagship products, I don't want to say, I mean, I just know that it won an award. The 2021 High Times Hemp Cup Award was your best athletic rub, which I tried and absolutely loved it. So, I mean, um, that was a big award, right? It must have been exciting to win that. Good recognition there. Yeah, I mean, we were we were excited to be, I guess we're probably the first Texas company to win a uh, cannabis cup. So that recipe actually came from our salve, which is about 20 years old. I made it for my dad who played pro, uh, professional baseball. And they told him if he could mitigate pain, then he didn't have to have surgery. Um, this was later on in life. And so I started making the salve for him. The athletic rub is just a different version of that where I've put other essential oils and different um, arnica and carrier oils that repair your muscles and get you back on your workout uh, the next day. So that's what that was meant to be. And it was sort of a, a unique item because of that. And I, I uh, and, and, and the tea tree oil and everything gives some immediate relief. So um, I think that's why we, we placed really well with it. Mm -hmm. It's a great product. And um, a little side note, we'll talk after we stop recording, but we did get a tweet when I was promoting this episode that a, um, a form, you know, an influencer online, I'll say for now, wants, is interested in um, talking to me about a brand ambassador of yours, because I think cool. he's tried the product and uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, so, hey, I want to switch gears. I want to talk to you about the consulting side of the house, Greg, because you've been doing that basically from the start, right? So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about some of the problems that your clients face on an ongoing basis and how you help them solve those problems. Um, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing is, and I, I've seen this multiple times, is I see farmers buying greenhouses um, that are not meant to grow hemp and not set up to grow hemp. And I see them paying some, some of the millions of dollars for these greenhouses, uh, some of my clients, and they're, they're not set up um, to prevent humidity swings. They're not set up to keep constant temperatures uh, when it's required during the plant's lifetime. And so a lot of it is um, that. And then also we see a lot of nutrient companies telling farmers to add nutrients to um, dirt and soil mixtures that already have all of the nutrients that they need in them. And, you know, I think part of it is I want to think everyone, um, uh, I want to see the good in everybody, but I think part of it maybe is the nutrient companies don't understand or the farmer doesn't tell them the whole story. 
they don't know exactly what soil they're using. So they recommend a nutrient and they're putting that on top of a soil that's already there. So I see a lot of toxicities uh, as well. And I'm not saying that it's all uh, bad advice that's caused all of this, but farmers need to do their research and figure out what they're buying. If you're gonna buy a greenhouse, go see it in person. If you're mm -hmm. gonna pay half a million dollars or even a hundred thousand dollars, go see some hemp in that greenhouse and see it thrive and let the farmer show you um, test results. Let them show you a successful crop. Let them tell you why they're so happy with their greenhouse builder. Uh, same goes for consultants. I, I've, I have taken over close to a dozen different consulting uh, projects where the consultant had a fancy website, had uh, known, known a lot, has degrees, known a lot about corn or cotton or soil or whatever, but this is a special plant. It's not like any other plant. Right. I've grown lots of other different plants and, and actually consulted on other uh, species of plants. And this thing is different. And if you don't have a consultant in your corner that has done this before, that can has a proven track record of making farmers successful, then you probably shouldn't hire that guy. And I only say that because I have gone behind and had to clean up uh, messes for lack of better words and and get our farmers back on track and donate time and donate um, manufacturing services so that they could get back on their feet. And, and I, I, all I have to say is that if you are um, consulting for someone, make sure that you yourself have a proven track record and it can show them some plants that you finished that, that are, you know, that are, that are, and that are uh, making the farmer successful and bringing them in revenue. That's one of the main things that we do here is we like to talk farmers off the fence. So <laughs> we try to prevent them from uh, uh, spending too much money. Um, we, we like to do, get farmers to do stuff in small batches um, we a lot of times try for the smaller consulting contract and get them to move up to the larger one. Um, and we just, what we're trying to do is we're trying to weed out, pun intended, um, uh, the services and the ancillary things that, that were, were causing some of our friends and other markets to fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's totally fair. And you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm seeing this shift, right? Like there's, there's these new farmers that are entering that, like you said, they have experience growing different crops, different vegetables, but this plant is unique. And, yeah. you know, you, you have to have the experience that you've had, the, the know-how, the trial and errors, the failures to kind of get where you're at, to know what you need to do. And then I also see this dynamic of this industry is so new that there are additional ancillary services that are needed. Like, marketing, like a website, yep. like sales, because this industry is only going to get more legitimate, right? So you've got, and so that's where I can see kind of, it gets a little muddy because when people come out and they're saying, oh, I'm a consultant, I can do this, I can do that. It's like, well, you, you have to be wary of that, right? Because right. there's, it's so new that, you know, there's people that may have bad intentions or are just sort of looking to make a quick buck, you know? I, I honestly believe that a lot of the people that I've seen, that's not what they're, they weren't trying to, to do that. They weren't trying to deceive anyone or to, to turn it, um, you know, they, 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 they had the best intentions in mind. Um, so they were trying to, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to do everything correctly, but you know, they didn't, they didn't have the, um, the experience to, to make it happen and to make a successful farm. So I, I don't believe that the, um, the people, the consultants that were doing this really had bad intentions. In fact, I've, I've talked to some of them and they had all the best intentions in mind and they thought they could do, um, what, what they said they could do. It's just, they, they weren't there yet. Right. And, right. and that just goes back to what I said is let's make sure that, that uh, the people that you're hiring 
no matter who it is, that they have experience and have proven track records where they can they can show their success and show their clients success. Mm -hmm. Your approach is is so it's it's the right approach in any kind of consulting industry, right? You want to start slow. You want to build up just like if you were starting a business, you don't want to, you know, take a bite out of everything and try to be all of the above when you need to, you know, figure out your core competency and then build upon that. And so um, what would be your advice right now for either new farmers wanting to get into hemp or farmers that have experience growing other crops, but want to, you know, transition to hemp because the market hasn't really stabilized yet. Right. So what, what is your kind of go-to advice to someone that just wants to get started? I mean, uh, start with a small crop, grow 20 or 30 plants. I, I see farmers trying to put thousands of plants in the field. Um, if grown correctly, you're talking tens of millions of dollars of products with a thousand plants in the field. Um, you don't need that much to, to start off. Um, you can find companies like ours. There's other there are companies like us out there that will white label for you. So what I tell farmers a lot is even when they're beginning, um, get some get some products white labeled and made, get your logo and, and all of that put on it. Um, obviously don't lie and deceive and say that it's your, your stuff, but you, know, you can white label a product and come up with a custom product and recipe by a manufacturer like us or someone else and start your distribution early on. Start it by doing a small batch of plants or start it by doing a white label. And then when you get your harvest, then you know where you're going with it and know what you're going, going to do. So what we see a lot of is people come to us with hundreds of pounds and very little money to process or turn it into anything and no way to, to distri distri distribute the products. Right. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the worst thing that we see right now for companies in Texas is um, have a plan to get rid of your, your stuff. Um, the, n n not all and most, <laughs> most of the time tolling. So taking your products to someone and having them keep some of it, um, some of your oil or some of your, your flour or some of the final product. Most companies that I'm talking to that are doing what we're doing, we're not doing that. Um, right. and, I, and a lot of them, the prices that you're getting back are not really fair for the work that you put into. So have a distribution in mind first. Right. No, that's, that's sound advice for sure. And, you know, I recently had uh, Jax Finkel on, she's the executive director of Texas Normal. I'm sure you know her. And we mm -hmm. talked about, you know, the, the landscape when it comes to the cannabis and, and hemp uh, issues, you know, at the, at the state level. And right. so, you know, if you could pull out your, your uh, crystal ball, Greg, and, you know, tell us where you see the Texas hemp market, going um tell us what do you predict i mean as long as the, as we are and, th and this is a big thing that i talk about a lot in in my speeches and in conventions and on podcasts is if we can self-regulate so there's not enough regulation right now in my opinion because we're not seeing the tda very much here um we're not seeing the department of health much here and I'm sure it's the same with other manufacturers and our retailers don't see them that much. Um, so what we need to do right now is we need to regulate ourselves and protect this market so that if we're putting out products that are not um, uh, up to what we say, our label claims are incorrect. If we're, 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 we're not testing enough and we're not we're not keeping those label claims where they are, and we're not testing products that are made for us, then we're going to get regulation that we don't want. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get control that we don't want. Right. So in the meantime, while um, you know the state and the, the federal government are, are changing these things and getting these policies correct and getting their inspections you know, regular, let's regulate ourselves and let's make sure that there's not pesticides in in the products that our retailers are, are that the retailers selling retailers go test your own stuff i mean if i make something for you go test my stuff I'm, I'm i'm glad for anyone to do that and let's make sure that we are putting out um an ethical product 
Yeah, I think that makes so much sense because if you self-regulate, like no one knows this industry better than the operators that are in it, right? Not the elected officials. And they're going to have to play catch up when it comes to education. So when the time does come, not if, but when they actually do come in and start to regulate a lot of these things, to your point, you know, we, we might as well do it the way we know is best or the operators know it's best, right? Because Again, they're on the front lines, not the elected officials. So it seems like a way to can kind of control that conversation. And I think doing that, it, it, and if we can do that, and, and if the, the, the people that are manufacturing and selling and farmers, if we'll do that, then the, the, it makes the state um, and, the, and the regulating uh, authorities uh, have you know faith in us that we're doing the right thing and we'll see them trying to pass uh, less laws that that will hinder you know our, our our availability to make money to bring in revenue right exactly yeah absolutely I mean just do the right thing right <clears throat> yeah so Greg I want as we wrap up I want to give you the floor what what do you want to leave the audience with fat last words what, things that you're that are top of mind for you you got the floor yeah I mean um we're just glad to be here in Texas doing what we love. Um, we're, we're here for the Texas, you know, for the hemp community. Um, we are, in fact, um, this will be the first time I've announced it publicly. We are uh, putting on a uh, Texas Hemp Harvest Festival that we hope to be annual. We reserved um, a very large venue. We're huge uh, uh, shows have been put on Carson Creek Ranch. The date is solidified as October 23rd. It's not something that Sweet Sensi or, or our company is doing to make money. It is an event for the Texas hemp community and for the um, hemp community across the South. Um, so this is just a, a way for us to show what it is we really do and, and why we're doing it. And it's something to get everyone involved. So we're going to have chemical extraction companies there just like i said we have no problem with them we're going to have everybody that that we can and we'd like everyone to come out and participate and we really want to turn that event into to something that's year round for texas and bring you know guys like yourself in to help promote it and just make it a community thing um it's not it's not something that's for sweet sensi even though we're putting it on uh, it's something that we're doing for the state of Texas, and and that's what we really need is is we need to join together, self-regulate together. Uh, we need to to to, and that's what that's what we want is we want this cannabis hemp community to to be stronger together, and to show the regulating authorities that we're doing the right and moral things, and and to show our consumers that that we're doing the right stuff. I love it, Greg. I'm, I'm, I'm putting that down in my calendar, October 23rd. I'm going to make it a point to, to try and be there. I know that that's at the same time as or close to MJ Unpacked. And I, it's a, it's why a bunch of stuff. It's right after it. So okay, but then, we're hoping then, that everyone can leave yeah. Vegas and head, and head to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it's right down the road from Dallas. So uh, I'm, I'm saving it and I'll be, help promote it as well. Because to your point, man, the Texas cannabis community, you're seeing it right now in real time. You know, everybody's just coming together after the 87th legislative session. You know, a lot of the policies that were pushed through or even brought to the surface were just from the people, you know, and right. and, and advocating and, and, and being at the Capitol and talking with our state uh, senators and whatnot. And so um, I mean, that's, that's go that ahead. goes back to what you asked. And that, that that's how uh, that's how we make things succeed. And that's how we make this industry succeed is by um standing together and making sure that together as a community um, that we're regulating ourselves and that we're um, keeping, you know, revenue streams where they should be by doing that and, and, and educating our customers. For sure. Couldn't agree more. So I'll be sure once, you know, you have a web page or a link for that event, we'll yeah. put it in the description box. We'll put it out on social media and uh, yeah, man, love, love all the great things that you're doing for, you know, not only the Texas hemp community and industry, but you know, the industry overall, all, and that is doing the right thing and, and making high quality handcrafted products. So Greg, really appreciate your time, your insights, where can people find your social media websites, things like that, if they want to learn more? 
So our Instagram and Facebook are Sweet Sensi Wellness and Meet uh, Sweet Sensi. And then our website is sweetsensicbd.com. Um, and uh, all of our email and contact information is on, on those places. So we appreciate it, Kevin. Awesome. Of course. Yes. And thank you again for having me back in April. I really enjoyed it, man. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And thank you all for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.